helping business leaders grow themselves, their team, and their profits. This is Andre Leadership. Now, here's your host, Ken Coleman. From the Music City, this is the broadcast of leaders, by leaders, for leaders. Thank you so much for joining the conversation. We're really excited about this episode. We're bringing you two feature conversations. How about that? A big theme today are the stages of growth in a small business. And we're going to start off with Clayton Mask, who is the co-founder and CEO of Infusionsoft, and then the CEO and founder of Kamado Joe. This grill is unbelievable. Taking on the venerable green egg. It's a great story. You're going to love it. So much great content. Of course, we have some free resources for you as well. Our first conversation is with Clay Mask. Clay's a great thinker. If you think about Infusionsoft, if you know anything about them, this is a company that obviously has got great leadership. They found a need and they have fulfilled it. And one of the big parts of the conversation you're going to hear is Clay talking about how 7% of small businesses, only 7% rather, get past Stage three, what are the stages? Stage one, you're under 100,000. Stage two, under 300,000. Stage three, under a million. So this is going to cover the whole gamut here. Really, really good stuff. And you'll also hear us talk about the pain points or the leaky buckets in your business. So a great thinker, and this is great stuff. Here is my conversation with Clayton Mask. Well, this is exciting to have Clayton Mask on the line and on the video, depending on how you're consuming this conversation. The CEO and co-founder of Infusionsoft, one of our dear partners. What a great relationship we have with with your team, Clayton. It's good to have you with us. Thanks for hanging out. Oh, you bet, Ken. It's a total pleasure. It's great to be with you. And I I love the partnership that we've created. And it just just keeps getting better and better. So thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, we're going to start off with a really, really important topic that our audience constantly brings up to us, Clayton. And the good news is you really understand this. And Infusionsoft works on this on a daily basis to help companies. And that's the idea of scaling. Yep. How do we go from where we are to that next level? And so I want to talk about before you get there, you got to prepare to get there. And, you know, it sounds kind of simple, but we as entrepreneurs and and go-getters, sometimes we we forget about the preparation and we just start on the journey. And you know all too well that preparation is really important. So set us up. How do we need to be mentally and logistically thinking about preparation? Yeah, you bet. Well, Ken, I think that it starts with understanding that businesses go through normal growth curves. And what happens is these growth curves are based on the stages of business growth. And I've, I'm not going to go too much into the detail, but suffice it to say that when, when we had been in business for several years, we noticed kind of a, a trajectory and a growth curve, these stages that we were moving through. But then we started to see it in our customers and we saw it again and again and again. And we got to a point that when Scott and I wrote the book, Conquer the Chaos, we said, you know what, it's actually becoming predictable what businesses go through. And we, th- we think we should write about this. So we ended up doing a bunch of research at the time we wrote Conquer the Chaos. And we don't lay out the stages of small business growth in the book, but we certainly began the research there. And so long story short, Ken, there are predictable stages of growth that businesses go through. And these curves of growth, think of them as kind of S-curves, where you sort of plateau at each stage before you get things resolved and then pick up in the growth to the next stage. That's really where you've got to, what you've got to understand first and foremost as you think about growing your business. Because if you don't understand those kind of laws of business growth and those stages that occur, you can find yourself sort of you know, banging into the same wall over and over and over. And so I guess what I would say just succinctly, Ken, is there are predictable stages of growth And when you understand that and you identify where you are, then you know how to get through to the next stage. Mm. What are some of the challenges now that we know, okay, we're going to, we're going to be realistic and we know there's some stages of growth and we're going to hit some walls or some plateaus. What is the right way to react or maybe be proactive knowing that you're going to hit maybe that lull or that plateau? Right. Right. Well, the key is to know what it is you're hitting and why you're hitting it. When you don't know, it can be so frustrating. And like you said, as business owners, we're just used to plowing into challenges and conquering them and moving forward. And sometimes 
those challenges are pretty big. And so it can really do a number on your confidence. You can get frustrated with it. You can start to feel like, man, you know, do I, do I have what it takes to get us through these challenges? When you step back and you realize, oh, these are natural. These things are normal. They're actually predictable. Then you have the, you have the ability to approach them in a very different way. So I think I would just say, if you know they're natural, you know it's a common thing, you don't have to feel defeated by it. You can be confident that, oh, I, I can work through this. And, and we can certainly share with you some of those challenges that you hit that you need to work through in order to get to the next stage of growth. Yeah, let's stay right there. This is great because you're talking about these stages of growth. I'd love for you to take some time and unpack that for us because I think you've really set what I believe is a clear expectation for folks. that so This is the reality. You know this. You've written a book about it. You help businesses through this. So walk us through some of those challenges. For whatever reason, and I'm not sure exactly why the reason, I have some thoughts and opinions on it, but a really shorthand way to understand, are we hitting a stage change and that's why we're having these challenges, is to recognize that the changes happen at revenue sizes typically on the 1, 3, 10, and so forth. Here's what I mean by that. At 100,000, you're hitting the end of stage one. At 300,000, end of stage two. At 1 million, end of stage three. At 3 million, end of stage four. At 10 million, end of stage five. And it goes on to 30, 100, 300 billion, and so on. So if you're at the one or the three in your revenue, chances are you are at that stage change and you're going to need to adjust some things. So that's a shorthand way for people to sort of self-identify. Are you hitting kind of regular business challenges or are you hitting stage change challenges? Because those call for a little extra kind of entrepreneurial finesse to get through them. Yeah, that's really good. I like that. Okay, so let's walk through that. Uh, so, yeah. so we've got people that say, all right, we're, Clayton, you're on it, buddy. We're coming up on that three, whatever that, whatever the multiple is yeah. there, but we're coming <laughs> right. up on this next three level and I'm starting to sense it. And I think you're right. What am I looking for? Here's what it looks like. When you're at the stage one and you're under 100,000 in sales, usually your issue is just not enough hours in the day. That's the number one limiting factor. When you get past that and you've kind of got the business going a little bit, what you find to get to 300,000, you really have to have somebody who's taking responsibility for sales. And while that sounds so fundamental and so obvious, especially when you're past it, if you're in that 100 to 300,000, usually what happens is you're so used to just doing the work, doing the work, doing the work, that you don't have somebody that's dedicated to making it rain, bringing in the sales. Either if people don't like it, the business owner thinks it's kind of a plaid jacket, car salesman, whatever, but you got to realize that's actually a function that's got to be handled and got to be handled effectively and consistently in order to get to 300,000. Then the real trick is going to a million. And this is where most businesses get stuck. Only about 7% of businesses ever get past 1 million. Wow. And at this point, you've got to create a marketing system with a service program behind that to serve those customers. So your marketing system has to consistently bring in customers. It's not just about closing sales. It's actually about having a funnel and a way that you bring prospects and leads into your business in a systematic way. But then even more important, you got to have a service program that's going to take care of those customers effectively. Otherwise, you've just got a leaky, a leaky bucket and you're bringing customers in one end, they're going out the other, and that doesn't help you. So that marketing and service system is the key to getting to a million. And Ken, this is where, like I said, 93% of the businesses are. They're in that stage one, two, and three. And many of your audience are not, you know, they've gotten past that, but it's good to kind of recognize how they got past that. And then for those folks who are in one of those stages, you can kind of recognize, okay, this is what's happening. We got to work through those stages. And depending on where you are, you got a little, little bit of a different prescription or solution to get through it. You've got some great articles that you've written. And so I, you know, kind of look through some things as we, as we look at this idea of preparing for that next stage. And one of the things you suggest is to adjust the product market fit and specifically yes. say, so you got to invest in your current product. Why? Why do we need to do that? That's right. Well, and here's the, the reality is that at each stage change, you've got to make a product market fit adjustment. And the reason, Ken, is that your target customer changes as your business grows. 
You may not think that. And you might think, no, it's just doing the same exact thing and continuing to do more of it. But the reality for entrepreneurs is that you've got to make small adjustments to your product, to the target market that you're serving. Because if you don't, you end up trying to serve all people and you don't get specific and clear enough in solving the problem for your target customer. And so it's just not valuable enough. And so when you're on these stage changes, you got to recognize, okay, it's probably time for us to tweak our product a little bit. Sometimes that means bringing on a new line of your product to appeal more specifically to a subset of your target customers. Sometimes it actually means dropping off a part of your product set because it's no longer helping you to grow. Maybe the price point is too low. Maybe it's too generic a solution for the more sophisticated customer you have. But that product market fit needs to get little tweaks and adjustments as you go through each of the stage changes in the small business growth success path. Mm. Okay, so now let's talk about what we need to do that's foundational that will help us move into this next stage. So we know it's coming. Establishing a foundation, you've written about this as well. What does that look like? And then why is it so important? Yes, what it looks like is you're very, very clear on your purpose and your values and your mission, the philosophy of your company. And you've got to have that really clear, particularly at these stage changes, because so many other things are changing when you hit these stage changes. You're, you're changing your product market fit. There's some strategy changes. We'll talk about this in a minute, but you'll have some people and team changes that occur. What happens at stage changes are your people, process, systems, product, those things all get tweaked. And you need that in order to stimulate the progress and the growth. But you've also got to preserve the core of who you are. And that foundational core of your purpose, your values, and your mission is what's got to stay intact. It's really kind of what grounds you as you go through these stage changes. And if you don't stay grounded in that, man, you, you, feel, like you're, you feel like you're in the middle of an earthquake. Everything's changing and it just feels so tumultuous. And you got enough changing at these stage changes, you want to keep your core philosophy nice and strong. Yeah, that's a really strong point. Is this where, Clayton, companies, they forget their why, and then they look back years yes. later, and then they go, well, this is what happened. Yes, it's exactly what happens. And it happens at these stage changes that call out the need for adjustment, and people lose the clarity, and they say, oh, you know, we're changing all these other things. So they start to change some of the foundational core culture of the company. And that's really problematic. You actually have to preserve that part while you stimulate the progress in other areas. Mm. Okay. So this leads to, I think, a really sticky issue for a lot of leaders. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking forward to your answer on this. There's an old folksy phrase. I'm sure you've heard it, Clay, that says, dance with who brung you. And it's just, have you ever heard that before? <laughs> I have heard that. Yeah. Yes. You know, we Southerners like to say things like that. And so, there's a lot of great truth in that. And it's a wonderful phrase. It speaks to loyalty. Yep. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you here because I think there's a lot of people that need to hear this from you. While that is a nice saying, and that is something that is ideal, and it's something we aspire to, right? To, to take the early people with you that were in the early days or early stages, and, and they stay with us throughout the yep. entirety of the organization. But the reality is, when you go to a stage change, we know this from experience, and I know you do as well. Some of those people aren't the right people. They were great in the early stages, but for a yep. myriad of reasons, Clay, they're not the right people to go with you into this new frontier. Is that right? And then how do we really assess that and make the changes necessary? Ken, thanks for bringing it up. I, I suspected that's where you were going when you, when you said <laughs> this next thing, because it really does come down to the people. And I'm going to put it very straight. I wish it weren't the case. I truly, deeply wish it weren't the case. But the honest fact is that most leaders aren't going to stay with you through two stage changes. That's the truth. A good leader will help you go through one stage change. You know, that's three times growth. And a really good leader will help you go through two stage changes. That's like 10 times growth. But it's a very, very rare leader that will grow with you through more than two stage changes beyond 10 times growth. Why is that? Yeah. Let me share with you another saying that I think you'll like. There's some truth to you've got to dance with who brung you. There's also some truth that those who get you out of Egypt won't take you to the promised land. Yes. 
Yeah. So you've got to look at that and say, okay, well, are those two things completely incompatible or is there some overlap? And I actually believe there's some overlap. And here's what it is. Sometimes the people who you've had with you need to take on a different role and they're still able to contribute a lot in the company. But as a key leader, it's probably not the case that you're VP of sales is going to be the same VP of sales with you when you're 10 times bigger. Now, there are rare athletes out there who can do that, who can actually keep growing, keep getting better, keep pushing themselves, and they actually have the appetite and the desire to be in the company when it's 10 times bigger. But most people either don't have the desire, it's just not their cup of tea. It's not really what they like. They like it more when it's small and closer and a little more family friendly and just all those things. And they don't really want to be in it at that next level. Or if they do want to be in it, they struggle to really push themselves. So this really gets to why, Ken. Sometimes they don't have the desire. Sometimes they don't want to just do the hard work to push themselves. And sometimes they just don't know what it looks like and they can't imagine it. Yes. And they don't go out and learn from others who have done it and been there and push themselves to say, okay, Here's, you know, here's what it looks like. Here's what I've got to do. They just don't have a model in their mind for what it looks like. Yeah. And, you know, we can't forget for a moment as leaders, Clay, that the idea of growing means change. Yeah. Change is a horrifying word (laughs) to a large portion of the population. And therein lies a lot of the problems, too. It could be they're on board with the mission. They're good people. They're willing to do the hard work, all these but they're unable to even process change because it's so different, especially when you see explosive growth, right? That's exactly right. And most people, it's just too uncomfortable to go through that amount of change. And the reason I started off by saying, I wish it weren't true is I've been through this. I've experienced it. I've watched it. I've had to make really, really hard changes in myself personally. I've had to change team members that have been really difficult because these are great longtime friends. People have been with me for years. You know, those are really hard things to do, but you said it right. It's that commitment to your vision, to your purpose and your values and the mission that you're up to. And to me, our mission to simplify growth for millions of small businesses worldwide is that's what drives me. That's what's more important than sometimes being able to work with someone who I've just come to love. And that's hard to do. It's really hard to do, but you've got to do it for the good of all of your other employees and of your customers and your partners and everybody associated with your business. Yeah, there's some people that are facing that right now. And maybe they're kicking the can down the road because it is difficult. These are real people. These are yep. relationships that you've been through some wars together. What yep. have you learned, whether it be from a failure in this area or a way that has worked? I think it's important for you to share some ways that we have some leaders right now that might be paralyzed by the fear of having to deal with this and say, you know what? Yeah. I love you, Bob. I love you, Susie, but it's (laughs) not working out and you're not coming with us. Whatever that scenario is, what's the right way to deal with that? You know, there's so many cliches around it about how, hey, if it's not working for, for the company, it's not working for the person. But there really is some truth to this, that when the company's struggling because that leader or that person isn't performing well, isn't isn't accomplishing what they need to, it's not a great experience for the person either. And so getting to that place where you can say, look, you know, it's just not working. It's not working for the company. It's not working for you. You know, I care about you so much. You've done amazing things. And there's no shame in looking back at the accomplishment and the progress and all the things that we've done together. It's incredible. And to say, you know, but I think we're to a point where there's something that is going to be a better fit for you. And the company needs to get somebody in that role that's just killing it the way that you did for so long. And that's that's tough to do. But I would say, number one, it's not working for the person. And it really is a service to them to help them get into a place where they are just loving it and they're doing awesome the way they used to do for you. Number two, it's not working for you as their leader you are weighed down. It's in the back of your mind constantly. It wears on your energy level. Your confidence is struggling because of it. You might even be wondering if you want to keep doing what you're doing or if you want to keep pushing the business forward. It's not working for you. And therefore, it's not working for the company. It's not working for anybody. And so it's hard. It's really tough. But what I've learned is time heals the wounds. It's hard initially. I've let best friends go. I've let family members go. Um, It's hard. It's really, really tough. But as time goes by, the individual finds success, the company continues to be successful, 
And, you know, it ends up being a good thing for everybody because as the company continues to grow and be successful, those who had a part in that success can be proud, can point to it, can build off of that in the next stage of their career, whatever's next for them. Yeah. And these kind of changes we're talking about, Clay, aren't just rank and file. This is also leadership changes. You talk about this. At Ramsey Solutions, we have an amazing culture where we see a lot of leaders come. We call them homegrown, right? So they come up through yeah. the ranks. They've been hired. Yeah. They've, they've moved up the ladder into leadership. But we also have some key leaders, top positions that came from outside the organization. I want yes. you to speak to that too, because this is it's kind of right in line with what we're talking about. So if you're looking at this next stage, and and so some of these leaders may not be able to stay in a leadership role, it's also finding the right leaders from outside who can come in with the qualifications and the experience and know-how and take the team to the next level. Will you speak to that tension as well? Developing leaders is really important for the businesses that are going from the stage of 1 million to 3 million, and then 3 million to 10 million. As you get past that point, you do need to bring in some outside leaders. You just tend not to be able to produce and, and develop leaders from within who have seen what it looks like when you're beyond 10 million. And so it becomes especially tricky as you move past that 10 million stage. But it's, it's also real at the 1 million stage and the 3 million stage. What happens is you've got to incorporate enough of the outside experience and that model of what the company needs to look like at the next stage, you got to combine enough of that with the inside cultural homegrown leaders that were developed. And that's a real art to blend that. Every entrepreneur who has built and blended those teams knows how tricky and difficult that is. So you've got to blend that. And what I would share is one nice little rule of thumb to follow is when you're bringing in that outside talent, you generally don't want to reach more than two stages ahead of where you are right now. In other words, it's helpful to have somebody who's been where you are and three times bigger to go where you are and 10 times bigger. Okay, that's helpful, but you start to get into a dangerous zone where they're thinking something so different than what the company is used to if they're more than two stages bigger in their sweet spot that it gets really tough to blend the internal leaders with the external leaders. So the trick is to bring in some leaders who have seen it at a stage or two bigger and help them to come in and blend into the entrepreneurial homegrown leaders that you have. And getting that mix right is a subject for a whole nother conversation, but that's the idea. Yeah, no, that's really good. I think that's really wise what you just said, making sure you don't get the wrong person because you're so far ahead in your thinking. We've been talking about the established business leader and the established business problems, but let's talk about startups. We have so many people, Clay, you know, who are entrepreneurial and they've just launched or they're on the verge of launching and they can't quite grasp what we're talking about, you know, over the last several minutes <laughs> for those young companies, those startups. And uh, there's a way to do it the right way. You know, you could save yourself tons of time and tons of money and grief and stress and everything else if you do it the right way. So there's several steps here that you've written and you teach about. And the first one is for startups is stay true to the core purpose. Why say that to somebody who's so new to the game? Is that a temptation? <laughs> well, what happens is when you first start, you kind of chase anything and everything. That's right. And, you know, you, you're just trying to keep the lights on. And I'll tell you, when we were in our early, early days, we weren't a software company the way we are today. We were just techie guys that would do anything and everything for a buck to keep the lights on and so we could stay our own bosses. And so there's a certain amount of pragmatic reality to getting started in a business that is less theory on get your purpose and your vision and your mission right. It's just more got to keep the lights on. So I get that. And I, the things I share are within the context of understanding that reality. I've been there. I know it. And so what I want to share is you need to, as much as possible, drive your company toward the vision that you have for it. And most people don't stop and take the time to create that vision. So as you're probably a big fan of Simon Sinek, it's starting mm. with why. Yep. You know, why are you doing this? And what I find is interesting Many business owners, many entrepreneurs in the very early stages, especially when it's just them, they haven't really stopped to say why. Their why is usually just because I want to do this on my own. I want to pursue the freedom of being my own boss. I don't want to go work for anybody. And so they have this kind of really 
deeply felt personal why, and then they have the reality of needing to pay the bills, and that causes them to run in a hundred different directions chasing a buck. Mm. And if they'll take the time to say, why am I doing this business? Why does this business exist? Why should this business exist? Why does the world need this business of what I'm doing? I'm taking my precious, valuable time on this earth to put into this business. Is it really just about a buck? Is it just about money? Because I would submit to you, it's not just about a buck and it's not just about being your own boss. In between that, is a really important why you're doing what you're doing. And it gets down to customers. It gets down to serving them. It gets down to solving a problem that is a painful, frustrating problem that you've come across in your life. And you believe you have a solution to that. When you get clear on that, it guides your sales and marketing activities so that you're not just running all over half cock chasing a buck. Mm, So true. And when you're clear on that purpose, Clayt, it's easier to create a purposeful culture, an intentional culture that serves that purpose. So obviously we started out talking about people. You and I agree people are our greatest resource. It's all about people. Winning in business is winning with people. But I want to talk about this, the idea that the why, which is that answers the question of purpose. When we know that we're able to hire and fire and train with that why right. constantly on the forefront. That's why it's so yep. important. It's not just a cool book yeah. idea. When you are growing your business and you start to hire people, what happens is you've probably gotten to a place inside of you, if the business is successful, kind of a gut understanding of why you do what you do. And yes, you're trying to pay the bills. And yes, you want to be your own boss. But it's, it's more than that. You've started to fall in love and become a fan of your business and what the problems that you solve. But when you start to hire people and the company starts to have some success and you're building a team, if you don't articulate that why, if you don't articulate your purpose and your values, how you go about doing your work and your mission, if you don't articulate that, you end up walking around, running your business, asking yourself the question, why can't I find good people? And so if you're sitting there saying, you know, I have such a hard time finding good people, the answer is actually right in the mirror. All you've got to do is articulate why you exist, that's your purpose, how you go about doing your work, that's your values, your core values you stand for, and what big thing you're up to. That's your BHAG or your mission. And when you get that clear, it's magic how it attracts the right people, repels the wrong people. It's amazing. Mm. All right, so another key point here for folks that are starting out is be selective with opportunities. And this is this is almost counterintuitive. Back to your uh, answer a few minutes ago, when you guys were getting started in FusionSoft, you were just doing anything that had anything to do with technical <laughs> if it paid the bills. And right. we get that. But if you're not careful, you fall into that mode of operation and you never you know, kind of square up that why statement with the actual amount of work we're doing. So we get a little bit of momentum. How do we make sure that we're not tempted by every opportunity that we're intentional for the right opportunities. Yeah, great. You know, it comes down to focus and the discipline to say no to bad sales. So what happens is in the early days, every sale is a good sale because you're surviving. But if you're not intentional about it, you said it exactly right. You get stuck in that mode and it prevents you from growing. And so if you say no to certain opportunities and let those things go, then you can put your attention, your time, your resources into the opportunities that really are worthwhile. In order to develop this focus and this discipline, you can look at your customers and you can identify who the profitable customers are because probably 80% of your profits are coming from 20% of your customers. You can get more disciplined in saying, we're going to say yes to the profitable customers and we're going to begin to say no to the unprofitable customers. You can do the same thing with products. You can look at the profitable products and the unprofitable ones, and you can say no to the unprofitable ones. But what you want to do is you want to have some disciplined approach to how you're going to get more and more focused and shed the things that are, that require a lot of activity and a lot of attention, a lot of resources, but don't contribute to the bottom line, to your happiness, to the success of the company. That focus to grow is the key thing as you as you build your business. And it will help you to kind of break through some of the challenges that you get stuck on in the normal course of operating your company. You just mentioned the phrase bottom line. I mean, that's, you know, to really understand that and get that as a young business when you're starting out, 
A healthy bottom line is lifeblood. It's gold. We've all heard the phrase return on investment. Let's talk about something you teach on that I think is a huge point here, and that's return on revenue. So as we start to get revenues in here, how do we make sure that we are leveraging and using the revenue to invest in the growth of the business? You know, we're talking with business, we're, we're talking right now about businesses that are in the early stages. Yeah. And what so typically happens is that revenue comes in, but it gets, it doesn't get put to work in the best ways. And what I mean in the best, putting revenue to work in the best ways is how can you reinvest that in more growth, in more customers, instead of using that, spending it personally or putting it in other things that aren't going to deliver more growth for the business. And what it comes down to, Ken, is you've got to systematically build your sales and marketing machine. This is not very intuitive for early stage businesses. Business owners that get started, if I were talking to a, a group of business owners today who were under a few hundred thousand in annual sales, so let's say they're you know, one, two, three hundred thousand in annual sales, and I ask them, what's their process for marketing and selling? You know, I'll get blank stares. I'll get kind of uh, uncertainty. Now, in their mind, they have a way for kind of how they do it, but they've never really mapped it out. They've never gotten it out of their mind and put it on paper and said, if I meet somebody here at this conference and they start to show a little bit of interest, you know, I'm going to call them back up. I'm going to send an email. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But pretty quickly, at some point, that process breaks down. There's not actually an automated systematic machine in the background that's making sure it moves forward through the pipeline. And it starts to become a matter of the business owner remembering and not dropping the ball. Well, guess what? I'm going to bet the business owner is going to drop the ball yeah. at some point because yeah. they're, they're wearing 20 different hats, running 90 miles an hour with their hair on fire. And no human can keep up with all of the follow-up and all of the tasks that need to be done in a sales and marketing process. And so my answer on the return on revenue is get a system in place that you can invest in that allows you to put prospects and contacts in the top of that funnel and work them through the machine and have them come out as happy customers that become lifelong clients for you. Yeah. That's the magic that you want to create to get return on your revenue. Yeah. And it just, it just so happens for you find people that Infusionsoft helps you do that. We really love you guys. Before I let you go, I've, I've just got to know, because we're always giving away free resources from you guys on every episode, but what are you excited about that's coming out from Infusionsoft in the future, whether that be near future or several years down the line, that you can tell us about? I love getting to know what's coming down the pike. As people probably know, the reason I talk so much about that sales and marketing process is I've learned in working with tens of thousands of customers and speaking to hundreds of thousands, if not millions at this point, that most small businesses don't have a sales and marketing process and they don't have a customer relationship management system. And so that's what we do. Our passion is to help small businesses grow and to simplify their growth by giving them this customer relationship management system, CRM system, and it helps them automate their sales and marketing process. So it is my passion. It's because I want to see business owners successful. I want them to grow. And I know that most of the time they don't grow because their follow-up breaks down because they don't have a system to do it. With that background, what I'm excited about is some new capabilities that we offer to our customers. We just came out with a new way for our customers to build landing pages and move prospects through those landing pages in a really effective way. So that's a new capability. It's really simple. It's awesome. I think, you know, to be honest, for a long time, our capabilities there were powerful, but they were really complex and they were kind of hard. And I didn't like that. We've created a really, a really cool new landing page component of our software that's awesome. So that's one thing. And then Ken, the other thing is along similar lines, for a long time, we didn't have a good solution for the solopreneurs, the one, two person company that didn't want all the power of Infusionsoft, but they needed kind of the basics to manage their customers more effectively and to do their sales and marketing more effectively. And we recently created a starter edition that has a much easier price point, a much easier path to get started. We've taken away a lot of the complexity and really simplified down the key things that you need to do to get started in the software. So that starter edition is something I'm really excited about. 
And then we got some other cool stuff coming, but I'll, I'll leave it with those two yeah. things for now. Yeah, he can't tell me that, folks, or, or they'll get a shock in my ear here, and, and that won't be pretty. <laughs> hey, that's exciting stuff. Both of those new offerings are really exciting, and I imagine there's huge room to serve that solopreneur, you know, with a simpler version. And I love that. So where would you tell folks, of course, we talk about you every episode, but if there, if that touched a nerve right there, how can they get the best solution or the best service right out of the gate to find out, is this the right fit for them? Yeah, well, they can, they can just go to infusionsoft.com and you can see the different solutions that we have. When you call us up and talk to us, tell us that you're with Entree Leadership. We love love hearing that. And it also helps us to kind of understand, okay, here's where you are. Here's how we can best yeah. serve you. So you can just go to infusionsoft.com. We've got other resources. I'm sure you'll give some other things out, but certainly they can, do, they can go to our main domain name, our main website. And uh, I got to mention that Clay is coming to us from their offices in the awesome Phoenix, Arizona area. We've got a great presence out there through Ramsey Solutions with the Dave Ramsey Show. I've been out to their headquarters. It's one of the coolest headquarters I've ever seen before. So (laughs) tell them you're coming. Go out there. If you're using their products, go out there and see them. It's just a great, great organization. You know, just tell them you're coming ahead of time or at least be patient with the receptionist. But it, uh, yeah. it's such a great place, man. So I re- you're okay with me telling people to, to come out Absolutely. there Absolutely. Yeah. You bet. We do tours all the time I to help it. people kind of see how we run the company, our culture, yeah. the way we do stuff, and just our passion for helping small businesses grow. So you bet. Come on out. All right. So I got to tell people, Clay, the broadcast of Entree Leadership is growing exponentially. And so when I was out there a couple of years ago, I, I went nuts about it on the broadcast. I talked about it. But it's been a while. So I want to tell people that when they come in there and they get a tour, they're going to see a, I think it's a 50-yard football field. Is it 50 yards? Is it that long? It's, it's, I think it's about 30 or 40. I don't know. Okay, it doesn't matter. But, it's a football yeah, it's, field right in the middle of the lobby. And then is. just to the left of the football field is the biggest cereal bar. Now, folks, I'm, not, I'm talking like a buffet line. <laughs> uh, and it's like, it's like a library of cereal boxes and yes. enough milk. To absolutely, you know, it blow your mind. And it's just there for all of the team to come have cereal. And I think yep. that's the coolest thing. It, those are just a couple of cool culture elements that I've always admired about you guys. So anyway, I just had to give a plug for the headquarters because I think you've done a great job. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate that. Come have a bowl of cereal with us, folks. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. He is Clayton Mass, the CEO and co-founder of Infusionsoft. Again, folks, we use their services. They're great folks. That's why they're the only outside organization we talk about regularly on this broadcast. Infusionsoft.com. Hey, Clay, this was good. It was really good. We need to have you back a little bit sooner this time, some more content, because this is helpful stuff. So if you're cool with that, let's do it. Absolutely. Love it. Hey, to help emphasize what Clay talked about, we've got a report for you from Infusionsoft that's going to help you define and achieve small business success. So this is a great report. It's going to come to you and you can read through it. A lot, a lot of good stuff. We're going to re-hit the stages of small businesses that I touched on and Clay touched on. And we're going to talk about some of the challenges and then coaching and education all important stuff to help you, the small businessman or woman, really succeed. So make sure you get that infusionsoft.com slash small business report. So it wasn't too long ago that I, uh, well, I went off the script and I like to go off the script as much as I possibly can. Sometimes it's just to make Eric, the producer, a little bit nervous, but I put out a call. I said, listen, I would love for you to send me not the electronic mail for Ken's electronic mail. What if we just get some old fashioned mail? I mean, you write it something out on a card, a letter, you lick a stamp. I don't even think you have to lick stamps anymore. I think they just come with the sticky on the back of them, as I recall. But uh, I I put this out there, and I was having a little bit of fun. Well, lo and behold, you people, you took it serious, and I'm glad you did, because we've gotten so many handwritten notes, and we appreciate you all so much. To get feedback is so great. In fact, I'm looking at Eric, the producer, right now. He's got a handful of letters and it's really fantastic. So I want to read a note to you. It comes from a young guy by the name of Dan. And Dan writes in, he says, Ken, Eric, and Will. He says, thank you for bringing an excellent podcast that is a mentor to me, even though I've never met you. I'm a year and a half since graduating from veterinary school and still very much a rookie. However, these lessons you are sharing, principles you're teaching, are helping me grow every single day. And I could see in my industry eight months ago, there were 
a lot of bad news items. But after listening to Pat and Jocko, Lou and Zorro and all the others, my lens has changed. Now I see challenges and opportunity like never before. God bless you guys mightily, Dan. Well, God bless you, Dan. You got to love that. You got to love well, the, the one line there that I really grab onto is, is his lens has been changed. And I once heard a, a preacher kind of preach on that, the idea of when you change the way you view things, it's like literally putting on a different set of glasses. And uh, I really like that. I think that's a great metaphor for all of us. We need to constantly be making sure that we're having the healthy view, the right view, a clear view. So good stuff. Hey, if you would like to send us a letter, uh, well, you can get the address in the show notes at entreleadership.com. Click on podcast. And of course, if you want to send us a digital email, we like to call it electronic mail, you can do that at podcast at entreleadership.com. Moving right along. How about another CEO? I mean, my goodness, two CEOs, one episode. This is why you people come back every week right here. You're really going to love this conversation as well. Bobby Brennan is the founder and CEO of Kamado Joe. Now, if you're not familiar with Kamado Joe, number one, you need to be. Uh, number two, this is a guy who was very, very successful. You're going to hear this in his story. But I love that he was a user of the big green egg. The guy loved to grill. And he's not trying to be unkind. He's not trying to be vicious. But he's looking at this, he's using it, and he's going, this could be better. And all the great entrepreneurial ventures in the history of the world are defined by somebody going, huh, yeah, I think there's a solution here. And I think, yeah, I might be the solution. And so Bobby Brennan founds Kamado Joe Grill. And uh, oh my goodness, we had a grill literally sitting between us as we had our conversation here in our Entree Leadership Studio. And I got to tell you, I was uh, trying as hard as I've ever tried to pay attention to my guest not because I was losing focus, but because I was imagining some meat on the grill. You're going to learn a lot from Bobby Brennan. Here it is. Well, this is a great treat to have Bobby Brennan here with us in the studio. And it's even better to have an actual Kamado Joe grill right there. We've got the, the charcoal. It's really distracting because I'm envisioning something going on that grate right there and eating it a little bit later. But Excited to have you with us, man. Oh, pleasure's all mine. Thank you, Kim. So, Entree Leadership is all about stories like Kamado Joe and, uh, you know, an idea and, and okay, we're going to go after it and we're going to take on a giant. Mm -hmm. So, let's start there because, you know, you guys are a relatively young brand. Uh, my notes tell me that you're about nine years old and now you got 44 team members, $30 million company. You're growing at 40% each year, but you took on the big green egg. Yes, sir. Why? What led to this? <laughs> What's going on in your head? Um, I owned a green egg. Okay. Uh, I, I loved it. I thought, <laughs> I, I thought it was a great product. Um, you know, truth be told, I mean, I, I was a corporate guy. I probably spent uh, 17 or 18 years in the corporate world with two companies. I spent my first 12 years with GE in Europe and the United States and then uh, switched sides and went to work for their European competitor, Siemens. That's how I moved to Atlanta. Green Egg is in Atlanta. That's where they own the market share in Atlanta. That's where they were, I think, started about 45 years ago. Wow. But uh, I was that guy in the, in the neighborhood that bought a Green Egg and convinced all of my neighbors to buy one. I convinced all my colleagues at work. You know, truth be told, I probably have sold two or 300 Green Eggs over the years. It's so ironic. Yeah, so, I mean, the great product. I loved it, not only because it cooks great food, but I just love the whole experience of cooking with fire and been out on the deck yes, on a, on a Saturday. You know, good Saturday morning for yes. me is yes. you know, putting on the baseball cap yes. and going to the butcher shop yes. and having a 42 minute. I love this. grilling breakfast for the family on Saturday. Oh, on, on, there's some weekends my grill never, never cools down. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I kind of reached a point in my corporate career where I just, I wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, entrepreneurship. I don't come from an entrepreneurial family, but I always wanted to own my, my own business. And um, probably the best piece of advice I got from a business broker I hired one, one time was he said, listen, Bobby, if you're, if you're going to start your own business or do your own thing, he said, do something you're passionate about. That's right. You know, he said, you know, don't be analytical about it. Don't do something because of the return on the investment. If you're going to be successful at something, you know, prerequisite to that is you have to be passionate. I agree. About it. Yeah. And, uh, 
I remember he telling me, I, I tried to buy a few businesses uh, in Metro Atlanta. Both fell through for different reasons. One of the owners got cancer and asked for a timeout. And the other guy just had second thoughts. And so I was kind of disappointed. And he said, why don't you start your own company? And I said, I, I don't know how to do that. I mean, I, I kind of know how to run a business. I had a pretty good career with uh, both GE and Siemens, but he said, look, you know, if you just pick something you're passionate about, it, you'll, you'll figure it out. I had this thought that uh, the Green Egg at the time had about 90% market share. Uh, everybody that I talked to about it went out and bought one. I'd have friends over on a Saturday night for, for dinner, and I'd get the call on Monday morning or Tuesday saying, hey, I bought one of those grills. So I knew it was a great product, but I just felt I could you know, make it better. I had issues. They always took care of it. They're great customer service, but... I felt like there's a way to, you know, improve the user experience and fix some of the uh, some of the issues. Yeah, my background was in manufacturing, so uh, throughout my corporate career, I had built factories, closed factories, moved factories. That's kind of what I did for GE. So I wasn't scared of that part. And so um, I had a business partner at Siemens. I was the president and general manager of the division. He was my CFO partner. He was wanting to do something on his own as well. So, I mean, it wasn't any more complicated than one day I suggested to him that we, we start our own grill company. Wow. And where, where does that start? I mean, it, it, do you have to immediately go, okay, what would a prototype look like? I mean, how complicated is that? Um, I'm an engineer by degree. Oh, okay. I, I do have an MBA, but I'm not the best engineer in the world, sure. truth be told. So, I hired an engineering company, or Kerry and I hired an engineering company, and they designed our first product. And... Um, I was on a plane to China to the birthplace of ceramics and uh, we found a guy over there that knew how to make them but didn't have any money. So we kind of financed um, you know, a new building for him and okay. I think he started with four or five employees. And, wow. Um, that was Because you understood manufacturing. Yeah, so. So, so that was in October of 08. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. And how so, long before the first launched the product after you started? I remember going to a trade show in March of 2009, and we had, I think, four prototype grills. It was the only four grills we had in the entire world. And uh, we went to that trade show. I think it was in Reno, Nevada, in March of 2009. Mm. That, was, that was the first time we were open, open the doors for sale. Mm. I want to go back to something you said earlier, because I think there's a lot of people that are facing a scenario that you mentioned. That is... The green egg was 90% market share. Yeah. Was that intimidating to you or did you look at it and go, this is actually a monster opportunity? I, I saw it as an opportunity. You know, when, when you work for a, a big corporation, you get coaching every year about what you can and can't talk about. You certainly can't talk about pricing. You're coached not to talk about market share, especially if you're a publicly traded company. Right. Especially if you're the, you know, the president and general manager of that company. I found that when you read a green egg, you know, printed piece on them or a trade advertisement on them, they were openly talking about, you know, having 90% or sometimes a phrase of that nine of every 10 ceramic grill, grill sold in the world as a big green egg. Uh, I saw it as a huge opportunity. Mm. There were competitors in the industry back then. There was at least two or three, but I didn't see... You know, we, we did a little bit of marketing research and we didn't think they were, you know, giving the green egg any competition. So I saw an opportunity. So why do you think that you you looked at it that way? Because I think some people might look at 90% and they look at the giant and they go, why, why in the world would I want to take on Goliath? You know, there's disadvantages to being Goliath. You know, they're, they're slow. They're not responsive. And so, you know, part of the challenge of being a, a small company and a startup is you got to be nimble. You got to think on your feet. You got to be able to react quickly and seize the moment, seize the opportunity. And so, you know, I, I, I just saw it as opportunity. Yeah. You know? I want people to hear that because that they, they need to know that your size really should not affect the dream because you felt like, hey, here's an opportunity here. We're going to see if we can exploit the giant. So there's lots of disadvantages to the incumbent market share leader. You know, they've already determine what their go-to-market strategy is. You know, to a certain extent, you know, uh, they're stuck in how they go to market. It's not easy for them to wake up one day and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to 
give up on my you know two step distribution strategy i'm going to go to focus on different sales channels so so there's some uh, inertia yes. associated with you know changing business strategies and so i think as the new market entrant you got to take advantage of that mm-hmm. how what are some practical questions that these davids out there that are listening need to be asking about the giant that they are thinking about taking on or that they are taking them on what, what are some of those things that they well, can it's, it's your traditional business school you know what does the what does the giant do well you know what do they not do well right. what are they focused on i mean it's not that difficult to discern what the strategy is of the market share leader and you got to, you know, understand, you know, where the opportunity exists and their weaknesses. Back when I started, you know, the Green Egg did a particularly good job of if you sold the Green Egg in Franklin, Tennessee, mm-hmm. you pretty much had the whole county to yourself. You know, you, you, you know, certainly a, a five or 10 mile radius, nobody else in, in, in Franklin could sell the product. That was a tremendous opportunity. Yes. There were six other people in Franklin that wanted to sell the Green Egg, but couldn't because the Green Egg was loyal to that dealer that had set up shop with them, you know, three, four, five years earlier. And, and that was just all opportunity for us. So when we went to our very first trade show, there were so many dealers that wanted to sell uh, the Green Egg that couldn't. There were so many distributors that wanted to be distributors for the Green Egg that couldn't. They just, we left that first trade show. I want to say we had... Seven or eight hundred thousand dollars worth of new business. Unbelievable! Yeah. With the four prototypes. With the four prototypes. <laughs> I love that. We didn't tell them that at the time. Of course not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's now a great story that we can share. But that's really great. So uh, I want to continue to learn from your story, yeah. so that entrepreneurs out there can take some encouragement away and some real things that will equip them. So take us from that first trade show. Four four grills. You got the deal in China. You helped build the, the the warehouse essentially, or the operations, so the guy can yeah. manufacture. Yeah. You walk away with seven eight hundred thousand dollars worth of business. Yeah. Walk us through the next couple of years. What was the growth like? What were the challenges? We started with two employees. It was just Carrie and I. And had you left the Siemens? Yeah, we both quit Siemens. Okay. okay. And um, we started uh, Kamado Joe. Okay. Hired an engineering firm. Um, hired a marketing firm. All right. Um, had a factory in China. Uh, Went to a trade show, rented a warehouse space in Atlanta, small. I think it was the first warehouse was seven or 8,000 square feet. Wow. And, you know, I got on a plane after the trade show, went to China, firmed up the the design and and, uh, said, go make, you know, 10 containers of product. We had all sorts of issues with the first several shipments, you know, not being, you know, made correctly that we had to think on our feet. Yeah. Unassemble, reassemble, get parts repainted in the U.S. I mean, it's not without bumps in the road. Right. But it's all learning experiences. You know, we invited our Chinese guys over to the U.S. and explained to them what the American consumer wanted and expected and finally got the quality issues uh, ironed out. And uh, we had a number of advantages to that first product over the incumbent Green Egg. I mean, it was, it was fully assembled. You know, we had... You know, use better metal. We galvanized our metal. You know, we had thicker metal, thicker ceramics, better gaskets, better top vents. So there was coming out of the gate. You know, we had a little bit of innovation mm-hmm. in our in our product. But we quickly went from two employees to three to four to five. Um, I would tell you, you know, as you scale your business from you know, being a $1 million company in year one to being a $3 million company in year two. You have to think about really three things. You you have to think about the people, Mm -hmm. the systems, and the processes that you need to be successful. Mm -hmm. And you always got to be, I think as a small business owner, you always got to be thinking ahead to, you know, how you get work done in a $5 million business is very different from how you get work done in a $1 million business. And so, you got to scale your organization. You got to scale your people, and you got to scale your systems. Mm. And so, you know, you start out with QuickBooks, but you know, you, you, you'll soon realize that a ten million dollar manufacturing business can't you can't run it on QuickBooks right. Enterprise. So, so you got to start thinking about ERP systems. You know, very quickly you realize that the business can't revolve around Bobby Brennan. You you need talent. Mm. You need smart people, and you got to hire 
people, you know, right now we're a $30 million business. You know, we're hiring people, you know, that I think are capable of taking our business to be $100 million. You know, we, we, we're hiring people from, you know, Ernst & Young, um, Deloitte, uh, KPMG. These are smart people that you probably not typical of a $30 sure. million dollar business. But as a small business owner, you're going to say, well, you know, this is the team that's got to take us to $100 million. Yeah, that really is an investment, isn't it? It's huge. It's huge. But I, I got to tell you, it's a lot of fun not being the smartest person in the room anymore. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. It's um, one of my lessons learned is make sure you hire the right people. Right. You Why know. is it fun? I love that you said, I think that's a healthy perspective. And I think some people will go, what, what do you mean it's fun? Because, boy, that's a big deal when the, when the co-founder goes, it's fun not being the smartest person in the room. Why? Why is it fun? Just to be able to sit back at a meeting and, and see people that you've hired, uh, people that you've motivated. Yeah, that's um, so healthy. It's energizing to me. Yeah. It's really energizing to me. And I, I think that's probably, you know, I, I do have friends that are at different stages of their entrepreneurial journey some are 10 years ahead of me some are five years behind me but i would say to you that the number one mistake that we all make is we spend too much time in the trenches in the weeds and and not understanding the big picture Uh, we don't hire quickly enough the right talent i got three or four guys in my business today that if if i left for a month they wouldn't miss me a bit Mm. Boy, that's interesting. There are some things I don't want to delegate, sure. you know, such as, you know, I like engaging with consumers. Yeah. I, I like having my finger on, on how we're doing in the market with our customers. But there are better salespeople than Bobby Brown out there. There are better marketing people than Bobby Brown out there. There are better product development people. And so I, I have a lot of fun. GE trained me really well. I mean, I spent uh, 13 years with GE during the Jack Welsh years. Okay, and, and yeah. it, it was Jack's re- been a guest on this show. Has he really? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, big shoes to I fill. I love Jack. Huge fan myself. But uh, he was he was very instrumental in my leadership training and uh, you know kind of drilled it into anybody who was coming up through the management ranks at the time, the importance of having, you know, uh, talented people working for you. Mm, that's so rich. All right. You said people, systems, and processes. Yeah. Those were the big three. Yeah. I, I, I think we understand people. We spent a good time on people just there. Um, I love this because I'm a big sports fan. Okay. And so I've always been enamored by high school football coaches. Yeah. And, the, and our audience has heard me talk about this before. Mm-hmm. That win year after year in a public school situation where they're not recruiting. Correct. But they've got a local feeder system right with the local football teams Mm -hmm. and these guys that have been there 30 years and they win championship after championship after championship and it's because they got the system these kids know how to run this these plays before they ever sniff junior varsity and so i I believe in that so much because i see it with champions in sport systems and processes uh, what's the difference in how you use those words? Because you, you clearly mentioned what, what's the difference between a system and a process? When I, when I think of a system, I'm thinking of uh, IT. I'm thinking of being uh, on the leading edge of, of using whatever tools that, okay. that, that are out there. All right. a, a process for me is just the, the X's and O's of right. how we're going to get this job done. Right. And so there's a supply chain process. There's a manufacturing process. There's a quality control process. Right process there's a financial planning process financial closing process but it's it's really important to automate and systematize Mm -hmm. using you know whatever you know latest software later latest uh, techniques but uh, we're we're big on on having a defined process and and a a defined system i love that okay so that leads me to the marriage Mm -hmm. between processes and culture Oh. Culture is a buzzword. Some people don't even know what a real culture is, yeah. but processes and culture are so intertwined. I've yeah. talked about this on this on this show. So I, you're from Atlanta, Correct. so that's Chick Fil A headquarters as well. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. So Dan, Kathy's a friend. When you go into a Chick Fil A here in Franklin, yeah. and you order something tonight, and then you go to the one near your house tomorrow morning and get breakfast. And you say to the young kid behind the desk, hey, thank you. What is that kid going to say to you? My pleasure. Is that a process or is that a culture thing? It's a culture thing. Yes, but what drove it? The process. Yes! (laughs) See, that's what I love. If you, to me, culture is very simple. Yeah. You you know, it's, it's, if you do something repeatedly. That's it. 
it, it becomes part of the culture. People ask me, how do you change the culture? You just change what you do and change yes. what you say. Yes. And it just, culture's a byproduct. That's of, it. The of, process of, is that somewhere at some point, every kid that gets hired there goes, listen, I don't care how many times the customer says thank you. You yeah. have to say my pleasure. Yeah. yeah. And then I feel as a customer, I feel like a million dollars. That's right. That's right. And so I love that. I, I set yeah. you up. I knew how you were going to answer. <laughs> no, but it's really truth, isn't it? Absolutely. No, absolutely. I couldn't agree with so you. So what are the processes? So open up open up the old uh, curtain here. And what are some processes that you, Bobby, are still super passionate about making sure that these are alive and well at Kamado Joe? We have a process for innovating. Okay. You know, I, I think if you were to ask our customer base, uh, what do we do particularly well? I, I think they would tell you that, uh, and what is our culture? I would say the words they would use is they would say we're probably innovative, we're transparent, probably developed a good reputation for customer service yeah. uh, over the years. So let's talk about innovation. We don't have an all-employee meeting. We don't have a weekly email that we don't, where we're not talking about new product development. It's just, it's ingrained in our organization, but it's ingrained in our organization because we make it a topic at every meeting and we talk about it. Culture becomes what you make important in an organization, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And so we have a process, you know, where, where we already know what the products are for, you know, 2018. We know what the products are for 2019, 2020. We have a product development roadmap that, you know, everybody clearly understands. I even talk about it online. You know, I get customer feedback. We're very open. We're very transparent with internally and externally about that. But um, definitely our, our culture is one of what can we do better mm. to improve the product and improve the experience. Yeah. You model the way on that uh, because I, I have read and I've got it here in my notes that you actually have a little bit of uh, back and forth. We won't call it arguing with marketing agencies that you've hired <laughs> because you you are in the weeds on a good thing when it comes to real people that are buying your product. You like to engage with them. Is this over the phone? I heard it's on Facebook. I mean, how, how personal are you? I make it a priority, to be honest with you. I think it's so easy now for a business owner to engage with their customers. You know, social media has yep. enabled that. I think it's a tool that you have to use, but I make it a priority. I, I set some realistic goals. You know, I'm not, you know, but I try to answer the phone five times a day. I, I try to reach out to a consumer personally one time a day. Now, when you say answer the phone, I want to make sure we don't slide by that. You yeah. mean you answer like the main line that's coming in on customer service? Correct. Yeah. yeah. How does that freak people out? But Not I, at all? I, I would say 18 times out of 20, most people, you know, don't know who I am. Well, that's true because you're not saying, hey, right. this is Bobby. I'm the CEO. But. There's at least once every third day. Is this is this Bobby? Is this is this the owner? So, and we usually you know usually a thirty minute conversation transpires. But it's a great opportunity for me to ask them, hey, what what am I doing well? What can we do better? Yeah. What's been your experience with customer service? Why why are you calling? I think it's really important not to delegate that as yeah. a business owner. That's great. Have you ever taken a call where the voice and the information on the other end of the line gave you a real stomach ache? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you got to be thick skinned. How do you react to that? You hang that phone up. If it's a problem and it's really your problem, I'm imagining somebody's getting a quick call and we're solving it. Well, you know, you, you got to answer the phone with empathy. You got to understand the situation right. that your consumer's in. I mean, people are spending a thousand bucks on my product. That's right. It's not a small amount of money. That's right. You know, I, I, I tell my customer service team, hey, look, I probably make four or five times the national average in, in income, but for me to go out and spend four or $500 on a golf club is a big deal. Sure it is. I'm going to ask my wife permission to do it. That's I'm right. I'm going to go test it three or four times. So think about a customer, you know, a guy who's making 40000 50000 $60,000 a year, spending $1,200 on a grill. Yeah. If something goes wrong in his fourth month of ownership, there's anxiety involved. Yes, there is. <laughs> and your job is to make sure that that anxiety is dissipated in, in three seconds. They need to know that they're in good hands. Yes. And that we're going to stand behind the product and we're going to do whatever it takes. We're going to move heaven and earth to, to take care of the situation. And so I tell my folks 
as a business owner, you know, one of one of the things I do is I, I try to decide on how we spend time and money. It's not any more complicated than that. You get two types of resources, time yep. and dollars. Every day you have opportunities across your desk. Do I spend money on this or not? Um, do I spend time on this or not? If I had a choice to take care of a thousand customers, you know, for a hundred dollars a piece, you know, warranty issues or, or customer service issues, a hundred thousand dollars on that versus a hundred thousand dollars on a new product versus a hundred thousand dollars on some marketing campaign. Every day of the week, I'm going to take yes. care of your existing customers. That's right. They are your brand ambassadors. Every single one of them that is delighted by your customer service experience is going to tell 50 other people about your product and so how wonderful true. you are to work for. Work so with. true. So customer service and innovation, I think, are ingrained in our culture mm. because it's what we talk about every single day. Yeah. What is the internal communication like at your at your organization? Because what's amazing is you only have 44 team members. It, that strikes me as kind of unbelievable because yeah. I, I see you as a national brand and all this. And, and here at Ramsey Solutions, we're like 600 and counting. What's the communication like among the 44? It's very transparent. So we, we share business goals. We share business results. There's no secrets. Everyone knows what the goal is for the month, whether it's a sales goal or a marketing goal, social media goal. We publish those daily. Everyone has access to it. But at the end of the month, we have an all-employee meeting or telecast where everyone, everyone calls in, even the remote employees. We share how we did for the month from a sales, profitability, what the business priorities are for the next 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. So it's very transparent. You know, emails, you know, I, I love what you're doing in the lobby here in terms of sharing goals with, mm. with all your employees. That's the best practice. So I actually took a picture of some of your monitors. That's and great. Uh, We're going to incorporate some yes. of that into our... You know, it's, it's, the, it's the law of the scoreboard, right? I just think people want to know where they stand. You know, the other thing too is it's not my business. It's That's our, right. It's our business. That's right. And it's our customer's right. business. And transparency is big to me. It builds trust mm -hmm. in your organization. You know, we're not big on office politics. We just, you know, here's the problem. Let's wrestle it. Everyone's got an opinion that's valued. But no, we, we're very transparent in our communication and our, in our business results. Mm. Everyone knows, you know, how we're doing, good, bad, or indifferent. What is the... Uh the model for you all versus and what I mean by that is the, the sales model. Is it dealer driven? Is it direct to consumer where they're buying direct from you online? What's that breakdown? About 75% of our sales is North American. Okay. 25% of it is international. In international, it's very simple. We go through distributors. Okay. In North America, we go through, uh, we have our own sales force. Okay. So we invested in, we have four warehouses in North America, two in Canada, two in the U.S., we go direct to dealers with our own, you know, W two employees. Gotcha. And uh, we we like that because we can control the the message. Mm -hmm. There's advantages and disadvantages. You know, some might argue you could scale quicker if you use distributors or independent reps. But we have 16 salespeople now covering North America for us, uh, roughly. But you know, we bring them all together for national sales meetings. Mm -hmm. We just had one a few weeks ago in Atlanta. Typically a three day meeting where we talk about, you know, here's the skills you need, here's the mindset you need, you know, to produce the results that we want. And, mm. and so uh, we bring in guest speakers, we yeah. give them a little bit of coaching. But no, we go to market on our own with our own sales force in, in the US and Canada. How involved were you over time with the unique selling proposition, right? That's kind of a business school term. And I think it's a little silly sometimes to kind of just focus on that. To me, it's about a narrative. But what is the narrative that your salespeople, if you were in the room with them right now and I got to eavesdrop, yeah. going, this is what we want you saying to the customer or the dealer. What's what's the differentiator? I'll be, I'm will be. i going to give you a very honest answer. I like um, that. Marketing has never been my strong suit. Got I, it. I think every entrepreneur will tell you that they're functionally strong in certain areas and, and they're functionally weak in others. I think... The first five or six years, um, we didn't we we didn't have clarity on what those differentiating uh, factors were and, and what our value proposition was either to a dealer or a consumer. And I, I would tell you that we evolved almost by accident 
into a, a narrative that says that focuses on innovation. Mm-hmm. You know, in, in our opinion, this is a lifestyle product. Right. It's very experiential. We are going to put the best product we possibly can on the field. We're not going to compromise. We're not going to cut corners. If there's a better way to do it, we will do it. And we will go to all four corners of the earth to find the right supplier or the right material or the right solution. But if there's a way to improve the experience, we're going to do it. Well, what happens when I buy I buy one this year and three years from now, you come up with a newer model that's got even more great, exciting innovation, and but I've already chucked out 1200 bucks for what's an already great product. How do you, and again, that's not a real problem in my mind, but I am bringing it up because how do you keep that narrative going with the customer? That's a great question. And it's, there's some frustration out there, you know, to, to a person who spends $1,200 today to buy this grill only to wake up 18 months from now yeah. to realize, wow. But if, if grilling is your thing, if, if, if that's how you like to unwind and that's your passion uh, and that's how you, you know, you, you love having family and friends over right. for, you know, six, eight times a year, it, it's no different than your golf club or your cell phone. If there's better technology out there, if you can get three, four years out of a product, you're going you're gonna to trade up and, and buy the latest grill. We have customers who, you know, bought a grill from us seven years ago. Right. And they're already on their third grill. Now, they, they may pass it down to their son or their yeah. son-in-law yeah. or give it to their dad. But grilling's your thing. Right. You, you're going to want to grill yeah. on the Ferrari. Yeah. And the reason I asked that question is because Andy Andrews is a mutual friend of ours. Yeah. And he knew that I was going to be hanging out with you today. And so he called me about three or four days ago. And he was just <laughs> telling me all these great things about the company. I mean, the yeah. guy, you know this. No. He's a, the guy's a brand ambassador. He speaks for sure. your company. He's very invested in you guys. Yeah. In his in but and, Andy's a classic example. He's got two of our large grills no, at, 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 at home. He walked into one of our dealers in Sand Dollar Lifestyle in, um, down in Orange Beach on, on the wharf there and saw our new product he, for the first time. He had to have it. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the two grills he has, but he no. says, Bobby, what you've done you right. know, is, 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 yeah. is, is remarkable. I'm going to lean on him now that I know he has some extras and tell him to ship one to me. <laughs> uh, so, so, but but here, here, here's where I'm going with that. The reality is, is it, when you made that comparison to the iPhone yeah. or to other things, but this is a lifelong product. Andy was telling me that this thing, Correct. this thing, yeah. whatever iteration you have, it's going to last you for life. Yeah. So in some ways, it becomes something that a diehard fan keeps upgrading for sure because he's the hero or she's the hero by passing on their older version to somebody else. That's correct. Isn't that the real payoff in making something that's so high quality? Absolutely. We hear stories all the time. Now we're, you know, the green egg is 44, 45 years old. There, I didn't know that. That's there amazing. are, there are products out there that have been passed down from father to son. They're on their second or third generation. We expect the same you know, thing with Kamado Joe, but they will last a lifetime. And that is the difference. Like, I, I think my daughter's, uh, she's eight, and I gave her about a year ago, like a four or five year old iPhone, and yeah. just no interest at all. No. But that's not the case with this product. And, and boy, that's huge. And, I, and again, I'm drawing all this but out. You know, you know, you know what's interesting, though? I mean, I, I do engage with our consumer community on Facebook and yeah. all the social media platforms. I try to make a habit of, you know, spending at least four or five hours on a Saturday morning just, you know, engaging with them. That's great. And even some of our most passionate fans and consumers, they want us to come out with new products. Of course. You yeah. know, e- even though they spent twelve hundred dollars two years ago or fifteen hundred dollars on a big joe they are as as passionate as we are and, and give us suggestions on what we can do better and what, how we can make the product better mm. you know as much as possible we try to make the older products upgradable with some of the new some of the new features yeah boy that takes vision doesn't it absolutely Absolutely. It's exhausting, you know, because I'm not an engineer mind. So to think, yeah. how do you make something that well done and then make it to where, well, we can add this and add this. I mean, that, that really blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, there's been a few exceptions, but I would say most of the improvements we've made, you know, the person who purchased the product two or three years ago can right. go out and buy an upgrade. Now, this is a fun question for me, relatively young company eight yeah. years old. So you're really just getting going and, yeah. and, and you've already kind of foreshadowed. You've got some talent in the place right now that can really just blow the top off of this yeah. thing. The temptation to diversify 
too much outside of this main product. I'm assuming that you get opportunities or ideas that come across your desk all the time. Yeah. What's a good process for making sure that you don't get distracted from the main thing? I wake up every morning thinking about grills. <laughs> <laughs> There's some other guy out there that wakes up every morning thinking about accessories or thinking about pizza ovens. Right, right. You, you know, I, I really can't compete with that. I can only That's be good. I can only be passionate about one thing. So I, I think I think you got to stick to your knitting good a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I do get opportunities, and, and you got to be very disciplined to know when to say no. Yeah. We have, you know, our product development, the scope of our, what we're trying to do is if there's an accessory or a feature that somehow improves the versatility or functionality of the grill, we want to do it. Mm. If it doesn't, we don't. Yeah. It's very simple. That's so good. And so how do I make that grill more usable, more functional, and how do I give my consumer a better user experience? If it doesn't fit into that, mm. we, we just have to have the discipline to say no. Mm. So how do you avoid becoming or avoid what Green Egg has happened with you, which, you know, again, you can't stop competition. That's what I love about America. You can't yeah. stop somebody from competing and competing makes you better. But how do you make sure as you grow that you aren't susceptible to maybe what Green Egg was susceptible to? I think you got to welcome the competition. I mean, you, you just said it. Competition is better for the manufacturer. Yep. It's better for the retailer, and ultimately, it's better for the consumer. You know, at the end of the day, you know, every industry or every product category needs four or five good, good competitors, mm -hmm. just to keep everyone honest and keep pushing everybody. You just can't rest on your laurels. Yeah, you got to have this insatiable desire to continuously do better. Yes, it's a never-ending process. That's right. When you think you're done improving the product. Something always happens. We say, "Whoa, yeah, that would be good." Yeah, and so we're working on things. I mean, you know, I probably you alluded to it earlier. You know, my marketing company thinks I, I'm, I'm too open and transparent with our consumers, but we are working on some things. You know, two, three years out that are pretty remarkable. I, I think we'll, we'll, you know, game changers in a way right. for um, you know the charcoal grilling industry. Mm -hmm. But um, you got to have vision, you got to have foresight, and, yeah. and have the perspective that innovation is never going to stop. Yeah. I mean, you, you think there's not going to be an iPhone 13 yeah, that's right. in, in 2020? That's right. Of course. Yeah. You do something that I think is the ultimate competitive advantage. So I'm going to brag on you. I know you're a humble guy, but I don't run companies, but I've been blessed to sit down with people that I don't belong in the same room with. You are one of them. But the thing that I've observed about really successful business people, successful coaches, mm -hmm. successful generals, success, you pick the, the role, is that they never lose an insatiable curiosity. Now, you said insatiable a minute ago, right? This insatiable desire. But you have an insatiable curiosity. It's why you spend four or five hours on a Saturday when you don't have to. You could be at the country club, you know, playing golf. There's some great golf courses in Atlanta. I lived there for yep. 13 years. <laughs> you know, there's a lot you could be doing with your sure. time. Sure. The insatiable curiosity, Bobby, is what I think makes you really, I don't want to say bulletproof because I don't know if that exists, but it sure does protect you because you're always learning from the customer and that is what fuels everything else you just said. That's what I admire about you. Oh, thank you. But it is a little frustrating at times. You'd love to be able to switch it off every now and yeah, again. But but it's... Um, Keeps I, your ear to the ground. I don't know what it is, but I think if, if you show me a successful small business owner, they all have that ability and that insatiable appetite to continuously do better. That's right. The minute you you rest on your laurels, uh, um, you're dead. It's, it's game set and match. That's right. It's game set it's and match. It's over. You may not it's know over. it, but it's over. You know, I'm I'm 50 next year. I mean, I'm not I'm not old. Oh no! Uh, and I'm not young, but I I don't know. But I I still have my energy level hasn't waned one bit. Yeah. And I think it hasn't all been uh, been smooth. Sure. For for eight years, I mean, there's been some lessons learned along the way. Any small business owner has got to be tenacious. Yeah. They got to have an insatiable desire to continuously improve yeah. their process, their systems, and their people. Yeah. And if you do that and wake up and their products, uh, you'll be fine. Yeah. 
Well, great stuff and uh, really excited about the growth of this company and, and learning about it. And, and again, Andy Andrews, just who our audience knows so well, just thinks so highly of you. And, and boy, this is exciting to see uh, how you have begun this journey and where you're at now and where you're going. Thanks for being here. I know uh, that there's a lot of small business people who are better for you being here today. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Thanks to Bobby Brennan and his team for allowing us access. And I got to tell you something, I, I always get inspired by hearing stories like this. You know, who would have ever thought, you know, that you could take on somebody like the Big Green Egg? And you can, and you can do it and do it well, and they are doing it well. And I got to tell you, if you didn't take anything else away from Bobby, the idea of him being intimately connected to his customers, he's got his ear to the ground, his finger is on the pulse. You need to wake up and smell the meat on the grill if you're not doing it because you are totally walking blind. All right, uh, Entree Leadership got a great tool for you. It's called the Entree Leader's Guide to Delegation. Now, you heard Bobby talk a little bit about delegation. In this resource, we walk you through the 10 basics of delegation. We've got a chart in this tool called the Entree Leader Time Tracker. So what it does is it helps you lay your week out in 30-minute increments per day. So you write down every activity, and then you uh, also label that activity. Is it important? Is it less important? Is it a time waster? Or do you hate it? And by the end of the week, what's going to happen is you have an indisputable chart of how you're spending your time. Unless you're in there doctoring it later. I know you people aren't going to do that. Hey, give this a try. Because what it's going to do is, it's like journaling your, your eating habits. And it just gives you a very clear picture of what you're actually doing with your time. Where do you need to be delegating? That's the whole point of this. What is the work that only you should be doing? So to get this, you can text the word delegation to 33444. That's delegation to 33444, or you can get the link in this episode show notes at entreleadership.com. On behalf of Eric, the producer, engineers, Will Rudder, and Jim Babb, and the entire Entree Leadership team, thank you so much for listening. We'll talk with you again very soon. 